Hello, um, this is the fifth session of our Enneagram day, and I'm going to be talking about the, the, the Odyssey and how it relates to the Enneagram. You may recall that in our first session, I talked about two approaches to trying to understand what life is all about and what life means and how, therefore, we're to live. Now, they were through words or symbols that touch our minds and through myths and stories that touch our hearts. And they can, they, they can penetrate deeper into our subconscious mind than just words can. And we spent most of the course focusing on the Enneagram symbol and what it means. And it's now time to hear a story that sheds light on the Enneagram and may have been one of the inspirations for the way the types were placed around the Enneagram circle. So that in this last session, we will focus on the myth. Joseph Campbell, who studied the core myths in the different cultures and societies all over the world, came up with the idea of the monomyth. It's the idea that there are stories that are shared by people across different cultures in a way that transcends them and points to an important human process of transformation that's universal. Now, the hero's journey is one of those monomyths. It is about fighting the dragon. It's about facing the villain or the bad guy. Little Red Riding Hood is a well-known example. She's just on her way to the grandmother's house and there's a wolf that comes up and we all have to face that, that wolf. We have to have some kind of transformative experience that involves facing something that scares us. The archetypal hero's journey is really a psychological journey. It's a quest into one's own unconscious. The hero is the man or woman who has been able to battle past the personal, local, historical, psychological limitations that they may have so that they can transcend them and then arrive at a greater realization or actualization of who they really are. Joseph Campbell identified several different stages in the typical hero's journey, and we can break it down into three, although it's more complex than this. The first stage is departure committing to the journey, and in a sense, committing to attend this course was a kind of departure stage, although you may have committed to the journey many years ago as well. And in the process, Enneagram that I talked about in our second session, that is what happens at point one. In the Odyssey, it happens as he leaves the land of the Lotus e e Eaters, representing point nine. The Odyssey is a kind of mirror image of the process Enneagram that we looked at earlier. The second stage is some kind of initiation that is like a rite of passage and involves suffering of some kind. And it may, um, it may be something that we realize we've been avoiding. In the myths, it's often facing the monster, as I said. Um, that part is represented at the bottom of the process Enneagram uh, the gap between the four and the five, or the five and the four if you're going the other way around, and which I call the dark night of the soul. Now the Odyssey features an archetypical trip into the underworld that has to do with us facing what is in the shadow, those things uh, which we are avoiding looking at, at, at in the shadow of our subconscious. So the initiation phase involves consciously going through that part of the journey that's really hard, that's really scary, and opening to that scary rite of passage in order to break through to the other side. It is experiencing a kind of death and resurrection or rebirth into a new state of consciousness. Now, having met that challenge, he or she then goes to the third stage, which is called the return, in which the hero comes back, reborn, and brings back benefits not only for himself or herself, but for their people to transform the world from which they departed. Now, the Odyssey is a legend about coming home to the true self, of learning who you really are through taking a kind of psychological journey. And the Odyssey, through its gods and goddesses and the mythic characters, is all about that same journey we're taking now, both in specific themes that have to do with the nine types, but also as a path of transformation. And it's also interesting to note that each of the main female characters on this journey are gods and not human. 
Joseph Campbell, who's done so much to help us understand the mythology of the different cultures, suggests that they represent psychological adventures in the mythic realm of archetypes, the archetypes of the soul, where the male must experience the import of the female before he can meet her perfectly in life, which Odysseus only does when he finally is reunited with his wife as he reach, reaches home. So now I'm going to share my screen. So if you allow me just a moment so that you can see some of the images which I'm going to share now. So let me just work on this for a minute. Here goes. Odysseus, the hero of this story, is the king of Ithaca. When he left his home, his wife Penelope was only 20, and he had an infant son called Telemachus. He has been away from his homeland for many years. The first ten of these he was fighting in the Trojan War, recounted in the Iliad, which is the prequel to the Odyssey, and he is the one who had the idea for the Trojan horse. The next ten years he spends on a journey that seems like a long way to get home. During his great wanderings, as he calls them, he is harassed by Poseidon, god of the sea, and left desolate. Meanwhile, his kingdom, his wife and son, are in danger. Suitors, who are assuming him to be dead, are after his wife's hand in marriage. They insolently consume the produce of his land and his flocks in wanton feasting as they wait. And they're also plotting to kill his son and heir, Telemachus, who is coming of age. To get home, Odysseus visits nine mythic lands populated by these different characters and gods and goddesses that match up with the nine Enneagram types. And that's why, as I said in our first session, I believe that this is evidence pointing towards the possibility that the Enneagram is rooted in very ancient wisdom. But in the way that the epic poem is structured, we first meet Odysseus towards the end of his wanderings. It's only when he is invited to tell his story to the Phaeacians that we hear the story of his adventures and the challenges he faced in these nine lands. However, I am telling the, the story in the order of the events themselves in order to line it up with the Enneagram journey. The painting shows Odysseus being guided by Athena, as goddess of wisdom and war, Athena naturally has a soft spot for the brave and wily Odysseus. She helps him out of many tough situations. And I see her as representative of the divine wisdom, often depicted in myth as a goddess. Before I launch into the story, it's important to stress that all of us have to make this kind of journey from the nine around to the one before coming home to our true selves. It's not saying that if you are a two or a one, you can bypass the rest of the challenges. The focus of this story is on the hero's journey, not on the journey of the individual characters he meets on the way, most of whom remain unreformed. In the first land that they visit, he and his crewmen meet an easygoing, friendly tribe that like to eat the flowers of the lotus. <clears throat> They're pleasant people, but they have no desires at all. They're really friendly, but they can't choose a path of, of action. They just hang out all day eating this lotus, and it puts them to sleep. They encourage his sailors to join them, and all who eat of this lotus don't want to leave the island. They just want to stay there. They forget that they're on the journey home. When his crewmen want to stay there, Odysseus has to take his men back to their boats by force and tie them to their rowing benches to get them to leave. So the lotus eaters represent the archetype of an unawakened nine who has fallen asleep to what the true self really wants to be and do in life. They are living in a kind of dream world, the state that Gurdjieff said most humans assume is reality. They have forgotten who they really are and what they're supposed to be doing. If we don't know what it means to be at home, to be our true self, there's little desire to undertake the difficult journey back home. Since this is the first step in the formation of a sense of separate self, it is the first that has to be challenged if we are even to begin on the journey home. 
And so that is why on this journey Odysseus has to begin at point nine. Odysseus has met his first challenge. His strong desire to get home means he does not fall prey to the enticing comforts of staying asleep. But all along, his crewmen represent the unbridled passions of the Enneagram ego personalities. Here at nine, you will recall the passion is sloth, or better, inertia, the resistance to change, the reluctance to move out of one's comfort zone. Uh, before I go on to talk about the next land they visit, which is an island where the one-eyed monsters known as the Cyclops live, I want to say a little bit about what they represent generally and how um, this is Anne Baring in her latest book, The Dream of the Cosmos. She writes, and this is the painting that she refers to in this um, on the screen there, early in the 20th century, French artist Olidon Redon painted a picture of the one-eyed giant, the Cyclops. Its single eye gazes over a flower-strewn expanse where a naked woman lies in a bril brilliantly luminous landscape. To me, she says, the image of the Cyclops reflects the constriction as well as the inflation of modern mind which, unaware of the vast dimensions of the planetary and cosmic life on which it rests, and out of which it has evolved, believes itself to be in control of nature and of its own nature. It evokes Blake's much-quoted words, May God keep us from the single vision of Newton's sleep. Yet the painting also communicates a tremendous sadness the sadness of a one-eyed consciousness that is cut off from the ground, that has no relationship with soul and with nature, personified in this painting by the woman lying on a flower-strewn ground. The rational or literal secular eye stands lonely and supreme, alienated from the landscape of the soul. When they arrive at their next island, Odysseus is not aware that this is where the Cyclops lives. He leaves most of his men to guard the ships and sets out to explore the territory with 12 of his men. They discover that it's a land of plenty, suffused with natural energy. The land yields bumper crops and, a nat and the animal life thrives. They come across a well-stocked cave, not realizing that this is the lair of Polyphemus, who is one of the Cyclops, and who is not afraid of the gods, let alone men. He thinks he has more force than the gods. He knows only power, not vulnerability. He is fearless and forceful and angry. This is the land of the unawakened Enneagram Type 8. When Polyphemus arrives back, rather than agreeing to their plea for hospitality and help, he traps them in his lair and starts eating Odysseus' crewmen. And he says he's going to eat them one by one. Those that are left realize that they have to escape somehow, otherwise he will consume them all. But Odysseus, being clever, gives him some wine and Polyphemus falls asleep. Then they bind him and Odysseus stabs him in his one eye with a red-hot stake. Polyphemus cries out for help, arises and removes the enormous stone from the entrance of the cave that li and lies there, thinking that no one would be able to come across him without him knowing. But again, by a cunning move, the six remaining men and Odysseus all manage to escape by hanging on under the sheep that trot out to their pastures in the morning. The monster, realising the sheep are going out to pasture and still racked by pain, feels the backs of the sheep and does not realise that his captors, captives rather, and tormentor are leaving him as well. So Polyphemus represents the passion of the eight archetype, the lusty, power-grabbing energy, naturally self-indulgent and excessive, but he also represents how blindness to vulnerability can lead to, to a downfall. 
Now, in ancient Greek culture, revealing your name to someone was a big deal. It indicates an openness to friendship. One of the clever things that Odysseus does when he first meets Polyphemus and realises he's not very nice is that when Polyphemus asks for his name, he tells him his name is no one. That's both humble but also very clever. Because when he stabs Polyphemus, and Polyphemus is yelling for some of his neighbours to come and help them, his neighbours say, who's hurting you? And he says, no one, so they don't come to his aid. By calling, calling himself no one, Odysseus is beginning to loosen himself from his identity as a famous warrior. But just when Odysseus and his sailors have escaped and they're running for, to their ships, he shouts out, saying, The person who humiliated you, who got the better of you, is Odysseus. That comes from the pride of the ego. And now Polyphemus is the son of Poseidon, who is, of course, the god of the sea. And that sets Odysseus up for all kinds of troubles, because Poseidon decides to get back at him. The challenge Odysseus has to overcome at the next island he, they come to, which is Aeolia, is to overcome the passion of type 7. Aeolius is the master of the wind. Now this is an island that has no fixed location. It moves, it floats, it moves with the wind, just like sevens, not wanting to be limited and having a lot of ideas and wanting a lot of options. At Aeolia, they enjoy continuous feasting and festivities as they float about. They're having a party. Life is easy, fun and enjoyable. Aeolius helps Odysseus by tying all the winds except the west wind in a sack, into a sack. And he gives Odysseus the sack of winds. And then he releases the west wind to blow him home. They get blown in the right direction. They sail all the way until they have Ithaca in sight and they can see the fires on the shore. But then his crew become curious about the bag of winds, thinking that there's a treasure inside. So, when Odysseus is asleep, they open the bag. And that unleashes these winds and they, which blow the vessel in which they've come across the sea all the way back to Aeolia. Quoting Joseph Campbell again, phrased in terms of individual psychology, whilst Odysseus, the governing will, slept, his men, the ungoverned un faculties, opened his wa the wallet. For the ungoverned faculties read passions, which for the seven is gluttony. Not necessarily for food, but for experiences. Hence they are always living in anticipation of the next interesting thing to experience. And hence they are also living in anticipation of the next interesting thing to experience and never really enjoying the present moment. When they show up again, the Aeolians think that the gods didn't like them because obviously they didn't get home, so they decide not to help them again. It is the action of the crewmen in focusing too much on getting their share of treasure, wanting to have more treasure for more pleasure, that gets them into trouble and represents the behaviour of the unawakened seven. So, without any wind to help them, they had to row. And after six days and six nights of rowing, on the seventh day they arrive at the next island. Odysseus moors his ships in what seems like a very sheltered harbour, surrounded by cliffs and a very narrow entrance channel. Well, I've seen a harbour that matches the description in the Odyssey perfectly and wonder if that was the place that inspired this part of the story. It's Sevenik in the on the Dalmatian coast. Anyway, the pilots steer their ship into the harbour and moor them next to each other. But Odysseus moors his ship outside the harbour mouth and ties it to a rock and climbs up to get a view of the lie of the land. Seeing no signs of life, he sends three of his men out to reconnoitre the land. But the people who live there are the Lestragonians, who are frightening monsters. They encounter, the, 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 their encounter with the Lestragonians is, is disastrous. For, for when they meet the monstrous queen of the Lestragonians, she and her monstrous king kill and eat one of the crewmen. So the other two flee back to their boats. But the Lestragonians chase them, and on reaching the shore around the narrow entrance to the harbour, 
they start throwing huge boulders at them. Only the strength born of abject terror saves the ship that Odysseus captains, and they lose the rest of their ships. Now, if you recall, the passion of the six is usually called fear, but it's more accurately, accurately described as angst, a fear that's without no particular cause. However, these Lestragonians are a little bit like, like the sexual six subtype, which is a countertype in that their way of dealing with fear is to go against what they fear, the counterphobic response, as it is called. They fear no one because they're so powerful, and they react aggressively, immediately, on the assumption that anyone approaching them must be an enemy. They see only threats, and they're not aware of the fear of strangers, but they just lash out. Odysseus and his crew sail on, heartsick, glad that they've been saved, but grieving for the loss of their dear companions. The next island at which they arrive is Aea, where Circe lives, and where he encounters Hermes, Zeus's son. Both Circe and Hermes have characteristics of the five. Each one guards and uses secret knowledge. Hermes is the messenger of the gods and keeps their secrets, and he's a symbol of boundaries and protect the protection that they provide. It's a little bit like being hermetically sealed, and the word hermetic in English is derived from this characteristic of Hermes. He is the power, he has the power, to bring out the secrets if he chooses, though. Now, Circe means hawk, and she's like a sharp-eyed observer, watching from far away. She is a mysterious sorceress who has magical powers. Once again, Odysseus sends out a party to scout out the land. When Odysseus's men show up at Circe's house, which are built on large polished stones around which they were roaming all manner of wild beasts who are most welcoming, because actually they're humans that she's bewitched and transformed with her wicked drug, so they, the crewmen don't realize that just at first. They hesitate at the entrance to her house, but when they hear her singing so beautifully as she weaves at the loom, they call to her and she invites them in. All but Eurylochus, um, Odysseus is second in command, who suspects a trap, enter. And she gives them cheese and wine, to which she has added a potion that will make them forget their homeland. And then with a stroke of her wand, she turns them all into pigs. Now the pigs are a symbol of the avarice of the five passion. So here on this island we have an observer and someone who's keeping the secrets, both features of the five personality and the pigs representing the avarice of the five. But as I've pointed out, the avarice of the five is not about withholding knowledge so much as wanting to withhold their thoughts, their energy, their time, their resources for fear that they will not have enough to cope with the demands of their energy. Eurylochus hurries back to the ship to report what has happened. Odysseus tells Eurylochus to stay by the ship whilst armed with sword and bow and arrows he goes to see if he can rescue them, the other crewmen that is. On his way he meets, he is met by Hermes, taking the form of a young man in the prime of his youth. He gives Odysseus a potion that will protect him from the effect of the potion that Circe gives to all who visit her home, so it, he doesn't fall under her spell. So seeing that, that he is immune from her, to her potions, she realises that he is Odysseus, for Hermes has foretold he would visit her. So she invites him to sleep with her, so that they may learn to trust each other. But before he does so, he makes her swear she will do no further mischief to him and his men. Because he's learned to safeguard himself against his fear of her, the te as she teams up with him, and she returns his men to him, and there is a joyful reunion of the men and the rest of the crew who now join them at Circe's home for a joyful feast. So, Circe tells him that before he can begin his journey home, he must first go to Hades, Persephone's land. This is the archetypical journey into the underworld I was talking about. 
Now, in hero stories, the hero is often someone who goes to the underworld and comes back alive. And there are a lot of different myths and stories that tell about going to the underworld territory, including um, the Aeneid by Virgil, and indeed the gospel story about Jesus visiting the underworld after he was crucified and before his resurrection. Circe tells Odysseus he must go to the Hades and perform a certain ritual and talk to this prophet there and to talk to other people. That's an essential part of his journey and of ours. And by the way, at the bottom of the Enneagram, between the five and four, we have this space, and I've talked about this as symbolizing the dark night of the soul, a kind of underworld experience, a place of ego, death, and rebirth into your higher self. So Odysseus experiences exactly this death and rebirth. Uh, it, it is the end, if you like, of Odysseus the warrior from the Trojan War and the beginning of Odysseus the man who's going to return home to Ithaca and find his true self. Whilst there, Odysseus hears from various characters in Hades and he learns about what happened to some of the people who died on the, in, during the Iliad for, uh, Odys uh, epic and some of the people he used to be friends with. Anyway, he makes peace with his shadow he learns things he needs to know to move ahead on his journey home. So the underworld experience is very important. In Stephen Mitchell's introduction to his translation of the Odyssey, a book I highly recommend as the best translation, he says of this episode, As in life, what seems to be a detour turns out to be the journey itself. The way down is the way up. The roundabout route is the only direct one though you didn't realise it at the time. Odysseus may groan at the prospect, but unless he first descends into the realm of the dead, he won't be able to return to his own life. So when he gets back, Circe instructs Odysseus while he's in Hades, oh sorry, before he leaves, Circe instructs Odysseus while he's in Hades to consult Tiresias, the blind prophet from Thebes, whose mind is still un unimpaired although he is dead. He is the only ghost to whom the dead goddess has granted discernment. The others flit back and forth aimlessly, mere shadows of what they were. Joseph Campbell says that this is an extremely important point. Not all in the dwelling of Hades, he said, are mere shadows. And I paraphrase what he writes, to explain that those who, like Tiresias, have seen and come in touch with the mystery of the masculine and feminine archetypes that Carl Jung called in the Animus and Anima, well, he called the Animus and Anima, and have in some sense at least integrated them, do not exist in the Shadowlands. I suppose that one could say that this is true of Jesus Christ. And as I pointed out in earlier sessions, besides being in the domain of a personality type, the six represents the masculine energy, energy and needs to be balanced by the feminine energy represented by the three. Only thus can the law of three operate and bring about growth into wholeness. So after his, he and his crew return from the underworld, he returns to Aea, Aea, where Circe meets them with these words. How bold you are, all of you. You've gone down alive to the realm of Hades. Other men just die once, but you will meet death twice, two times. Refresh yourselves now with my food and my wine, Feast here the whole day long, but at daybreak you must set sail, and I will give you the route you will need to take. What precise directions, to, with precise directions, to save you from any disaster on land or sea. So Circe gives him these instructions for the way ahead and warns him of certain dangers that he will face. First he has to sail past the island of the Sirens. The Sirens enchant whoever comes their way by in seducing travellers with their melodies so they can't go home. Like the Fours of the Enneagram, the Sirens can feel the unique anguish and pain of each individual who sails by. They sing about what each person suffers. 
They sing to Odysseus about what he suffered in the Trojan War, and their song is so sweet. The way they sing about each person's suffering is so intense, people who hear it want to crash their ships on the rocks and die when they hear this song. But because Circe has warned him about the sirens, he has put wax in his sailors' ears so that they won't hear the song. Now remember that they represent our unbridled passions. He orders them to tie him to the mast and not let him go, no matter what he says. He makes the voluntary decision to listen to the siren's song and know the depth of the human longing and temptation. He carefully plans that he is going to actually listen to their song of suffering but he's going to make sure he doesn't kill himself when he hears it by taking these steps. That, again, is more of the processing of the pain that's part of the shadow of the four. It's interesting to see how the type four is so well encapsulated by the sirens. When instructing him on the way ahead, Circe had given him the choice of two different routes. He could either sail past the clash, crashing rocks, but warns him that only one ship has ever managed to avoid them, or he can sail through the narrow strait between Scylla, Scylla rather, and Charybdis. Scylla is a six-headed monster hiding out in the cliffs above the narrow strait, of, and the Charybdis is a deadly inescapable whirlpool close to the cliffs on the other side. Something like the Corriavecan whirlpool between Jura and Scarva off the west coast of Scotland, except ten times more dangerous. These two dangers are a pair of opposites. The danger is that in sailing too close to either one of them, one gets stuck, metaphorically speaking, in a dualistic way of thinking. Odysseus chooses to sail through the narrow strait between Scylla and Charybdis, the way that leads to non-duality. Circe has also warned him about the perils of this passage and said that the only safe course was to sail closer to Scylla. He would have, therefore, to lose six of his crew who would be killed by the six-headed monster. In this part of the passage, he would have to exercise extraordinarily leadership skills in order to keep his ship on course. It's about having to sail through this narrow passage as quickly and efficiently as possible to survive and pass through with as few losses as possible, knowing that he wouldn't be able to do it perfectly. But he has to stay focused on his goal and keep his ego in check in order to traverse this narrow passage. This is the type three challenge, but actually there's more. Because he, face, he faces further challenges to his leadership. Circe told him that the next island they would land at would be Thrinacia, where the cattle and the sheep of Helios, the sun god, graze. She warns him not to touch them. But when their supplies run out and whilst Odysseus is, is asleep, his second in command, Eurylochus, convinces his men that being destroyed by the gods at sea is better than starving to death. So they slaughter and feast on some, thereby assuming for themselves the powers and privileges that belong only to the sun god, who sees and hears all things. Odysseus awakes, but it's too late, so he orders his men to set sail immediately. But Zeus destroys his ship, and everyone drowns but Odysseus, who is cast up on Ogygia, Calypso's island, which, when we read the Odyssey, is where we first encounters him. encounter him. Um, so, again, I think this is... Um, Probably, yes, this is Beatrice Trust Chestnut writing about this. These encounters and trials symbolize the power, power and pitfalls of the Type 3 personality. Odysseus' focused and authentic leadership served as many men as possible, so, sorry, saved as many men as possible under the harrowing circumstances, and in his absence his men assumed powers beyond their true nature and led themselves to their own doom. Calypso is a very obvious type too, or more accurately, the sexual two subtype. When Odysseus first arrives, ship shipwrecked on her island, she is very helpful. Homer describes her as a shining goddess, a queenly nymph. She is beautiful and elegantly feminine. She pampers Odysseus and gives him the best food and everything he needs, 
including all kinds of sensuous pleasures, but she also wants something from Odysseus in return. She tries to seduce him into giving up his dream of homecoming. She basically wants him to stay with her and live with her and marry her and be with her forever. Why suffer the hardships of the journey back home when he could become immortal and be the king of Calypso's paradise island? When we first meet Odysseus in the Odyssey, Calypso has kept him captive for seven years. She exhibits this feature of the two personality, wanting to stay in control of him and to love him, but to get something back in return. And this is most pronounced in the sexual two variant. But all the time, Odysseus is longing to go home to be with his wife, Penelope, who is faithfully waiting for him despite being pursued by a bunch of unscrupulous suitors. So he wants to leave, but she won't let him. On hearing about his situation, Zeus orders Hermes to go and tell her that she must let him go. Calypso responds by saying, I rescued him as he sat aside the astride the keel of his ship, when Zeus had blown it apart with lightning in the dark sea, on the dark sea. All his companions were drowned, but as that man clung to the keel for dear life, the high, high winds carried him here, and I took him and loved him. I even offered to make him unaging and deathless. But since no god can ever evade or cancel the will of Zeus, I will let him leave, is this is, if this is what Zeus commands, and I will see that he sails away from the island, and though I don't have the means to give him a ship and sailors to carry him home, yet willingly with good grace I promise to do whatever is in my power to send him on his way to his own dear country. And when she finally decides to let him go, she goes to the high side of the Enneagram too. She prepares everything he needs for his journey, and, for, and, and she gives him the materials to build himself a boat, and she lovingly sends him on his way with no strings attached. So he sets off on his hastily constructed boat, but Poseidon sends a storm that destroys his vessel, and he drifts, clutching onto a plank, and after two days he is washed up naked on the shores of Skrira, not S-C-H-E-R-I-A, where the Phaeacians live. Finding shelter of some bushes near the banks of a stream, he lies down under them and falls asleep. But prompted by the goddess Athena, who appears to her in a dream, the Phaeacian princess, Norsicaea, takes two of her maidens and cartload of clothes to wash in the stream near where Odysseus is lying. He awakens to the sounds of the girls laughing and covering his groin with leaves, approaches them and pleads for help. Nausicaa gives him some clothes to wear, and directs him to the palace where a feast is taking place. Now the Phaeacians love order, and are a disciplined conventional people. They are, cur they are courteous and concerned with doing what is right, both morally and religiously. Their architecture is perfect and they're expert sailors who always stay on the right course. But they also have a flaw, because they can be judgmental. Homer tells us that some find them to be bloodless do-gooders, and that their perfectionism can be a heavy and hectoring rather than graceful and helpful. They symbolise the type 1 archetype of the Enneagram. And it's interesting that the Phaeacians are the only group of people during his entire epic journey who actually help him. They represent the awakened one, aligned with the divine purposes. But first they ask him who he is. And on discovering that he is the hero of the Trojan War, ask him to tell, him, tell them about all his adventures he has had since then. And so he recounts the story just as I have done, only in beautifully poetic language. Having offered the appropriate sacrifice, the Phaeacians take him to the ship that they have prepared for him, and Odysseus bids them farewell with a blessing. Manned by their own men and laden with gifts suited to a king, the ship sails swiftly back to Ithaca with Odysseus fast asleep. Having left him to wake up on a beach in Ithaca and having hidden his treasures, the Phaeacian crew head for home. But Poseidon, 
resents the fact that they've helped Odysseus and made his, the final leg of his journey back home so easy. He resents the fact that as a result of the Phaeacians' actions, he's lost face. So Zeus permits him to turn the ship into stone, rooted to the seabed, as it approached the home harbour. So trying to be perfect does not protect them from the whims of fate. Well, there may be a message about the Type 1 shadow in there too. Uh, because you will recall that the passion of the One is the resentment. Ones resent the fact that those who don't stick to the rules seem to do so well, whilst they who have been so careful to do what is right don't seem to do so well. Odysseus starts off from Ithaca to fight in the Trojan War with 12 ships, but he ends up losing everything until, when he finally gets home 20 years later, he's by himself. All the crewmen representing the unbridled passions have died. Through all his trials and tribulations, he's come home to his true self. When he wakes up, Athena, the goddess who's been advising him and helping him all along, meets him and assures him he is now in Ithaca. She helps him plans how to deal with the suitors who are after his wife and advises him, in fact, I think turns him, to hide his identity and appear as a, a, a beggar. The awakened Odysseus has not lost his ability to act cunningly. He reveals his identity only to trusted servants and eventually to his son and finally to his wife. Together with them, he devises a cunning plan, an archery contest involving being able to shoot an arrow straight through the holes in a line of axe heads. He, the beggar, wins, thus revealing his true identity. Together with his trusted few faithful friends, he attacks and kills all the unrepentant suitors. That may seem like a violent way to deal with your enemies, but remember, this is a story, and we are not meant to take everything literally, for to do so is to ruin the story. Sorry, this is just, um, I, I, I didn't get the last slide right with the animation, but anyway, that's the last picture of Odysseus shooting his arrow through the, um, the holes in these um, axe handles. Anyway, a depiction of it. So, um, that's the end of this session, and I hope you found it useful. Um, there's a lot to reflect on there, and if you need it, I've got the sort of text of what I've just um, been through in the PowerPoint. So I'm going to stop recording now, and uh, that, that's the end of the session.